All right, everybody. Um, welcome back to Office Hours. Welcome to Summer B. Um, you guys are halfway through Orgo at this point, so that's the good news. Um, the not so great news is, is that this half of the semester is definitely the more challenging half. Um, this six weeks that are these six weeks that are about to come up are kind of very similar to what Orgo Two is going to be based upon, like. Each chapter from here on out is going to have its own functional group. And we're basically just going to take these functional groups, like let's say an alkene, and then see what a whole bunch of different other chemical species, like other reagents, would do to these alkenes and what functional, trans functional group transformations will result from them. Okay, so, you know, chapter six is going to be our first chapter that we're dealing with real orgo. We're going to be talking about alkene reactivity. And then, you know, chapter seven will be alkynes and chapter eight will be haloalkanes and so forth and so on until the end of orgo two. So from chapter six on, this is pretty much what you can expect for, the, your re for the rest of your career in organic as an undergrad. Okay, so it is very, very important that you understand the logic behind all of these reactions because in summation, I think there's about 140 total reactions in Orgo 1 and Orgo 2 that you will learn. And it is way too much to memorize 140 reactions and still do well on your test, like in the sense of like knowing how to apply them. So being able to, you know, rationalize things and being able to critically think is definitely going to help you a lot here. Um, if you do have my book, like at home with you guys, there is an extra page at the back that says notes. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you use this one page. And if you don't have this, just make your own. And it's a sheet of paper that basically is just going to sum up every single reaction that we did. So today we'll talk about our first one, which is hydrohalogenation. But for the rest of the six weeks, and then even into Orgo 2, I would have a running list of all of your reactions to, you know, have a good, um, I guess, concrete list of everything that you know. Okay, so let's just talk about carbocations. Okay, so over here, I want you guys to understand this kind of um, synopsis of carbocation stability. And what carbocations are, are, they're exactly what they sound like. They are carbons, carbo, and cations. They are cations that are carbons, and they are electron deficient. But we know cations to be electron deficient. They have six total valence, that gives them that positive charge, and that makes them something called an electrophile. So if it's electron deficient, because it's only six and not eight, it's gonna want more electrons, hence electrophilic or electron loving, okay? And that stability of that carbocation is going to dramatically influence how fast a reaction will progress, okay? So that's all we know so far. So let's just jump into page 57 if you guys are following along. And we're going to just basically rank these questions. Okay. So the first trend we're going to see, at least in number one, is something resonant, something called resonance. We also see something maybe called um, hyperconjugation and something called induction. So I see three different trends going on in A. So I'm going to take a moment to go to this side piece of paper and explain some of those trends. Okay. So. Let's just talk about resonance first. Okay, so I'm just going to abbreviate resonance. Okay, and essentially, let's just draw two different types of carbocations. So let's just say maybe this one, and then maybe let's say this one. Okay, so here it looks like this is a primary carbon. What, how do I know that it's primary? Well, you look to how many carbons are attached to this position. So this is what I'm looking at. There's one carbon attached hence primary carbon, okay? Same thing over here. We're looking at this carbon, what's attached to it? Well, one of them, so that's also a primary carbon. But the difference is, is we have this double bond, and you know, we said with double bonds, we typically tend to have pi systems, and in pi systems, a stabilizing feature is resonance. So you can probably catch this set of resonance arrows right here, these sets of resonance arrows, that result in this structure. Okay, so if you can't see that, we pulled electrons away. Let me number this, one, two, three, four. We pulled electrons away from two, put them in between three and four, so that means that electron deficiency should now be on carbon two, okay? So knowing where the positive charges go is definitely a very important skill. Over here, there is no pi bond or triple bond or anything like that going on that I could use to resonate, so this is all I have. So the fact that I can do this, the fact that I can push this positive charge around the linear structure is a stabilizing feature, just like what we saw with acid-base chemistry. So I'm going to draw like a smiley face right here. 
And that smiley face will just indicate to you guys that this is a good thing. This is a stabilizing feature, the fact that we can resonate. But over here, we can't resonate. So that positive charge is fixed at that one position. Remember at the beginning of the year, I talked about um, lightning as an example, why lightning, nat like li lightning naturally exists because there's an accumulation of negative and positive charge in the clouds and in the sky. And that fixed spot of charge is not a favorable thing. So lightning or this plasma will connect the sky and the ground to kind of alleviate that buildup of charges. It's kind of the same thing with chemical systems in the sense that, you know, we don't want this positive charge just to be localized at one spot. The fact that I can delocalize it over a greater region is a stabilizing feature. Okay, so now taking this a step further, if you were to say, you know, and let's say this was reaction A right here and reaction B, you know, and you know, reaction B is going to go through an, a, a structure like this and reaction B is going to go through a structure like that, which one would go faster? Well, if this one is more stable, that means the reaction is going to go faster because it has a lower activation energy. Remember activation energy, EA? Here, let me actually draw this better over here. So I'm just trying to blend all these concepts together. Help you out. So this is our activation energy. Okay. So this would, let's just say for B, this would be for reaction A, but then maybe for reaction B, that activation energy is something like that significantly larger, okay? So we're gonna try and connect these themes where carbocation stability is gonna influence how fast our reactions happen. Okay, so that was the first one, that was resonance. Our next trend that we're gonna analyze is something called hyperconjugation, and this is kind of cool. I've never really heard of it before I came to Orgo, so it's a pretty neat concept, hyperconjugation. And what hyperconjugation is, is it basically means that adjacent alkyl substituents. So adjacent alkyl just basically means carbon and hydrogens. So adjacent alkyl substituents can actually donate their electron clouds into that electron deficiency and stabilize it. For example, let's look at, um, hmm, let's look at a primary carbocation. So let's just look at this one right here versus, and then we'll do this one next. And then we'll also do this one last. Okay. So these are our carbocations. And remember, if you want to classify them, we see what is attached to that carbon. Well, what's attached to this one? There's one of them, so that's a primary carbon. Here, what's attached to this carbon? Well, there's one, two, so that's a secondary carbon. And then here, we see that we have one, two, and three, so that's a tertiary carbon. So clearly, we're changing what we call the substitution, and substitution just refers to, you know, the things that are attached to that main center. So the substitution pattern is changing. So what does that mean in terms of stability? Well, we know what um, these carbocations are. And what carbocations are, are these, you know, I'm just gonna draw it kind of in this fashion. Let's just say this is, I'm drawing, you know, picture this picture over here, over here. So essentially what it is, is it's, okay, so you can kind of imagine this planar depiction. All right, so CH3, 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 okay? And this is my positive, unhybridized p orbital okay so this structure is very important to know okay so all i drew all i did was basically i took this you know tertiary carbocation the way that it is rotated it like this and i'm analyzing it like that this main carbon where the carbocation is has an unhybridized p orbital these are sp2 centers so that's something you should know carbocations are always sp2 centers with an unhybridized p orbital this is really important Please know this with an unhybridized p orbital. Okay, and this unhybridized p orbital, although not relevant right now, but it's going to be relevant in about 20 minutes when I get to the first reaction. Okay, why why this unhybridized p orbital matters? But what happens is is that because we know we don't have any electrons in this lone pair, what's happening is is that these alkyl groups can actually slightly lean in. They can actually bend in. So remember, they're just electron clouds. Okay. And what they're doing is, is that this donation of electron density is really going to stabilize that deficiency. Remember, these p orbitals don't have any electrons. That's what a carbocation is. But these methyl groups that are adjacent to it, oops. can you guys all see me okay? I don't know, something just weird happened. Um, okay, so these adjacent alkyl groups can donate electron density in slightly, and stabilize it. So since there are three you know, substituents here, this would donate more than two groups, which would donate more than one group. So the substitution, as we're increasing substitution, we're increasing stability. 
okay? So we're increasing stability. Does that hyperconjugation trend kind of make sense now? Someone want to put something in the chat box? Perfect. All right. Good. Okay. And our last trend is going to be, I think, induction. Okay. So induction. Okay. So induction has the opposite effect. So, you know, we might have seen resonance before with acid base chemistry, and we knew that resonance was a stabilizing feature before. It still is going to hold now. It's also a stabilizing feature today. However, induction, which was a stabilizing feature back then, is not a stabilizing feature now. Okay, so that's just the one kind of switch that's happening. So let me do another example. Let's take that same primary, you know, carbocation example, and then let's compare it to maybe that same primary, but let me just add a fluorine. Okay, so these two. So what happens? Well, essentially, we know this is a primary carbocation, this is a primary carbocation. So hyperconjugation is not going to be a stabilizing effect here. And also, we don't see any pi systems, so resonance can't be a, sta uh, a stabilizing feature here. So clearly, something is happening with this fluorine. So we know that this carbon is electron deficient. And we know what fluorines like to do in other halogens. They're extremely electronegative. So they have, a temp they have a dipole moment towards that fluorine where this positive center is going to result you know, because that halogen wants more of the electrons. So it's an unequal sharing, which makes this slightly positive. But then what does it do to this positive? Well, if you're pulling electron density away from an already electron deficient center, it actually becomes even more positive. I'm just adding all those positives to indicate how deficient it becomes. So you're really making this even more deficient or more unstable. Okay, so I think that logic kind of should make sense for you guys. Um, nothing crazy here, just kind of using your logic. If you're pulling electron density away from an electron deficient center, you're making it more deficient or more unstable. Okay, so this is bad. So to remember this, again, our smiley face is there, our sad face is there, okay? I think that pretty much covers it for our trends in carbocations. And now we should be able to answer uh, question one on page 57. All right, so let's just jump in. Okay, so stop me guys if any of these aren't making sense to you or I make a mistake. Okay, so the first thing I always wanna do with these when I, give, when I get a set is to classify them. And by classify, I mean, secondary, primary, tertiary, and then right any other stabilizing features that are going on. So right here I see secondary. Remember, there's one carbon attached and another carbon attached, but I also see a pi bond. So I'm pretty sure resonance is gonna happen. So I would write before I do anything, secondary resonance as my like little code as what's going on here, secondary and resonance. Over here, this next structure, I see that I only have a secondary. So I'm just gonna write secondary. Here, I have just a tertiary. So I'm just gonna write three with a degree sign. And then over here, I see I have secondary, but I have something else. And it looks like that halogen is going to be induction. So I'm going to write IND for induction. Okay, once I write those things out, this should be pretty obvious. Okay, so we saw that hyperconjugation is, you know, better in the sense of a tertiary is better than a secondary, which is better than a primary. But does resonance with a secondary outweigh a tertiary? Okay, so if you're not paying attention, pay attention right here. This is something you should know. The lesser substituted carbocation that can resonate is more stable than the more substituted carbocation. I know that was a crazy amount of words, so I'll say it again. The lesser substituted carbocation, so I'm comparing this tertiary and secondary, the lesser substituted carbocation with resonance is more stable than the plain more substituted carbocation, which would be the tertiary. That's why I'm gonna give this one a four and give this one a three. If that doesn't make sense, I'll explain it again in logic right now. The reason why this tertiary is slightly less stable than the secondary with resonance is because all of these you know, alkyl substituents that are adjacent to this carbocation, they partially donate electron density into the ring. They're not gonna completely bend inwards and fill that vacancy. You can tell it's just because of their close proximity, they're slightly going to donate. With resonance, we saw, actually I'm bring that page back, with resonance, we saw complete electron delocalization where we could move that positive charge all the way across the ring. So because of that, because of complete conjugation or complete movement, it is a more stabilizing feature than this partial donation. Okay, so complete donation, partial donation. So that's why four would be better than three. 
But if you were to compare a secondary resonance with a plain secondary, clearly the resonance one is better. Okay, so that would give this one a two. And then this one finally a one because this one is the most, most, most unstable. And the resonance theory which is more similar to your resonance is not wrong. What are what are the induction groups to watch out for halogens and rest? Okay, so the first question. So what are the induction groups to watch out for? Halogens work. I think that's pretty much it. Any other like electron withdrawn substituents? So you could have like a ketone. You know, you could have um, I don't know an aldehyde. You could have you know an ether that's distant. You know, um, three, two, four, one. That's it. I see you guys are saying that three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one. Um, no. Um, go with my answer for now. And if I have another issue with that, like with the workbook key, we'll talk about it. Okay, guys? I'm pretty sure I'm right here. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so for B. Um, I hope that logic made sense. That's why I switched four and three. Because it's complete movement, it's more stable than this one, which isn't complete movement, which is slightly donating in. Okay, just go with me on that. I think it might be a key, an, a key problem. Okay, so over here on B. So again, same thing that we did before. So we have a secondary with induction. We have a secondary with induction. We have another secondary with induction, and then we have a secondary again. Okay, so clearly they're all secondaries. But the secondary without induction is automatically my best one because we don't have any sort of enhanced electron deficiency. What does it mean to have all of the, like three fluorines versus one? Well, the number of fluorines is going to influence how much that inductive effect is going to destabilize. So if you have more fluorines, you're gonna have more of an inductive effect. And likewise, if that carbocation is closer to that inductive group, it's gonna be pulled more or become more electron deficient. So you can see that this one is gonna be the absolute worst one because we have three inductive groups and look how close that carbocation is. Over here, we still have those three inductive groups but it's slightly farther away. So I can say that's two. And then finally this one because we removed two fluorines from that structure. So it's less of an inductive effect, okay? So that's how I would have done B. Okay, any questions on that so far? Even by substitute here for the number of substituents. Um, okay, by substitution, I mean secondary versus tertiary, if that makes sense. So there's one group, I'm gonna draw another color. Over here, there is one group, two groups, and three groups. So that's why I wrote a three, tertiary. That's the substitution. Um, but I could also say there are three fluorine substituents on this one carbon right here and there's one fluorine substituent on this carbon. So I might be saying substituent in two different contexts. Does that kind of clarify it, maybe? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. All right, so let's keep going. So then on C, we have a secondary, and it looks like there's resonance with this pi bond, so I'm gonna write resonance. So there's this one's a secondary, but don't be fooled, it looks like that pi bond is too far away to resonate, so no resonance. And then here, it looks like we have a tertiary, and it looks like it can resonate. And then here, it looks like we have a secondary, but again, too far away to resonate, but it looks like there's a chlorine. And what that chlorine is, is it's an inductive a group, so I'm gonna write IND, okay? So based on this classification scheme, I can basically say, okay, tertiary with resonance, boom, that's the best one I could ever get. Then secondary with resonance, okay, that's the next one. Then a plain secondary is probably in between. And then a secondary with inductive is destabilizing, so that should be one. All right, and that's how I do these. So it's not too bad, once you know your three trends, I think that um, should give you more insight. Any questions? All right, let's do D. Okay, so D is different. So instead of you know having all carbons in this ring, we have you know heteroatoms, and that's going to definitely influence the stability of that carbocation. Okay, so again, let's do our classification. So we see that we have a tertiary here, no resonance. Here we see we have a tertiary, but then induction with that fluorine. Here we see we have tertiary and resonance. Okay, so that resonance is possible. Remember, our lone pairs aren't drawn in here, but we have resonance with these lone pairs, okay? So we have a pi system. So how much that you know, lone pair wants to actually resonate 
is going to dictate their stability. So clearly we know these last two structures are going to be the best because they're tertiary and they can resonate. So how do we rationalize which one's better? Okay, so look at your periodic table. Okay, and you know that it goes, I think, hydrogen, lithium, green, so it goes nitrogen and oxygen. So nitrogen, then oxygen. Okay, in terms of left to right. Left to right. That's an O for oxygen. Okay, so the more right you are in the periodic table, the more electronegative you are. And if you're more electronegative, you're less likely to donate those lone pairs. So oxygen doesn't want to give its electrons, and I'll draw maybe this, as much as maybe this nitrogen does. Does that make sense? Because oxygen is more electronegative. Let me just double check that. Yep. Because oxygen is more electronegative, it doesn't want to donate as much. That's why this amine in the ring makes it four and that one three. Okay. That is a really, really unique skill to have for rationalizing carbocation stability because you know you don't necessarily see it right away, but remembering that lone pairs can stabilize things is why you know, you'd be able to get this answer correct. Okay, so make sure you definitely keep in mind all your old orgo logic. Okay, then to get the other two, we have two, which is just a tertiary here, and then one because this is tertiary but inductive, so it's destabilizing that structure. Okay, so I hope that makes more sense. Okay, and then lastly over here, Okay, so same thing. So here we have secondary, but we have a different, a different name. So I don't want to say secondary resonance. I want to say secondary benzylic. Okay, so this is a benzene ring. And specifically, when you're one carbon removed or one carbon like away from the ring, that's a very stable spot to be. We're going to see that. There's a couple of reactions that, we, that we'll have, you know, in orgo one and orgo two that react at this position. So just... I would, you, secondary resonance is fine to say, but get in the habit of saying secondary benzylic because it's gonna help you with future things. Just trust me on that. Okay, over here, we just have a plain secondary. It's too far away to resonate. Here we have a secondary, but it looks like it's close to this carbonyl, more specifically this ketone. So that's an inductive effect. It's gonna pull electron density towards that oxygen and make it electron deficient. And same thing over here. We have secondary and then induction again, okay? So if I were to rationalize, you know, how to rank these, I would say that my secondary benzylic or secondary resonance one is definitely going to be my best one. So that's four. Okay. And then so my plain secondary is going to be three. Okay. But then to pick between these two, well, I have one inductive group and it's an oxygen. Keep in mind that identity. It's an oxygen versus three inductive groups and a fluorine and the fluorine identity. So since fluorine is definitely more electronegative and it's in higher abundance, we can definitely say this is the least stable one and that would be the next one, okay? So I think you guys should be pretty good at ranking these now. You're obviously gonna get something like this on the test. Um, question, could the third structure have resonance as well? No, actually, so good question. You can't take this pi bond. This, is a, this violates a rule of chemistry. You guys haven't learned it, but you can't take a carbonyl pi bond and you can't do that. You can't break it away and move it down. You can't, okay? But you, you wouldn't have seen that in, in uh, chapter one, so you don't forget. Yeah. Is that Question? because the lone pairs are um, stuck in the sp2 orbital? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's move on. Uh, oh, we got, okay, we're good on that question. Let's move on to uh, number two. Okay, so now there is a um, different way of saying it, you know, so we don't know what intermediate means yet. Maybe you do from other chemistry classes and stuff, but we'll get into that in a second. So when we're given these pairs, we want to know which one's more stable. So it's pretty obvious anything we've done before. So here it looks like we have a primary, but with resonance. So I'll write that primary res. And then here I'll write secondary, but no resonance. Okay. So this one's kind of confusing. How do I know which one is more stable? Um, so, yeah. How do I know which one is more stable? So honestly, if you didn't know, because let's say, you know, back before we had this issue of knowing between, you know, a secondary resonance and a tertiary, what you want to do is, is you can basically draw other resonance structures and see, you know, where that carbocation lies. Remember this whole major contributor thing. So essentially it's like this. Let me draw that resonance arrows. And that leads me to this structure. And then I can draw another one. I'll move my hand in a second. 
Okay, so keep in mind that over here we had a secondary, okay, just plain secondary, but over here we had secondary, secondary, and primary. So these major, these other um, contributors, these, um, I'm sorry, what's, what's the word? I can't think of the word. Um, the uh, other contributing structures that it is. The other contributing structures have secondary carbocation characters. So see, secondary right here, secondary right here, and primary here. So the fact that there are two other structures that exist for this structure that are secondary and can all resonate and delocalize makes this one overwhelmingly more stable than this secondary by itself. Okay, so again, this whole resonance idea with major contributor is going to come back. We're going to see it on the next page, but this is definitely a tool to help you rationalize, you know, which structures would be better. Okay, so for B, we have a secondary one over here, and it looks like it's too far away from these oxygen lone pairs to be stabilized. So I would just say plain secondary. And then over here, you know, we can arguably say inductive, you know, based on how far away that is. And then here, secondary, but definitely with resonance. So I don't even have to think here. I know that's my answer, okay? Because resonance is better. Okay, and then over here, I see that I have a primary with resonance with this pi bond, okay? What does OCH3 do? Good question. So I'm gonna go back to B and answer that. So what does oxygen have? Remember, they have two lone pairs. So it technically adds electrons into the ring, okay? So this is another way you can rationalize it. They add electrons into the ring, which adds more negative to stabilize that positive. So it's a stabilizing feature. So you guys can say, you know, in cyclic systems, electron donating substituents or substituents that have lone pairs on them are gonna be stable. Whereas substituents, let me be like an aldehyde that wouldn't have a lone pair on it, they're electron withdrawing and they destabilize, they inductive, they pull things out. Very good question. Yep. So again, there's no one right way to rationalize these things. It's like, I'm going to give you all the tools that you guys can you know, possibly have, and it's up to you guys to see what's fit in what situation. So it's kind of fun, honestly. I like that. All right. And then over here, we have a primary, and then that ketone is inductive. Okay, remember, it doesn't have you know, any lone pair or pi bond that's able of donating down because they're stuck in that sp2 orbital. Okay, so that would make C of a structure one in C. Okay. And then D, um, we have a secondary over here. And then over here, we have a plain tertiary. So we know tertiaries are more stable than secondaries. So no thinking. Okay. So I don't think there's anything more crazy there. Let's keep moving. Okay. And I said this to you guys, you know, there was one do it, uh, not do it problem. There is one warm up problem that I gave you guys. And I was like, you won't know. I was like, assign major contributor. And I did that on purpose. And I was like, in, when we were going over it, I said to you guys, okay, we don't know how to do this yet, but we're going to come to it at some point. And here's the point right now why I gave you that, you know, um, bell ringer that's bell ringer that day. So this question basically wants us to, you know, draw the two remaining um, structures and rationalize which one is the major contributor. And now we will have that knowledge to do so. Okay, so right here, we see that we have, you know, these pi electrons next to this electron deficiency. So source to sink and do one move at a time. So let's do, you know, that series of mechanistic arrows and we'll get, you know, this structure. Okay, and then we can do it one more time and we can get, okay. Okay, so those are our structures. I think you guys can get the resonance at this point. But the next thing is deciding which one would be the major contributor. And we don't have other trends like, you know, the identity of the atom, size, electronegativity, things like that. They're all carbons. And more specifically, the only thing that's changing is the location of that carbocation. So I think some of you guys can pretty much intuitively figure out what this is. But this structure is primary carbocation with resonance. This one's a secondary carbocation with resonance. And this final one is a tertiary carbocation with resonance. Okay, so out of all three structures, this tertiary carbocation is the most stable for lots of reasons we discussed, resonance, hyperconjugation, et cetera. And that's why this is the major contributor. So before we didn't know why. We didn't know why you know, this specific placement would be better, but now we do. Okay. And now we're gonna talk about our first reaction and Markov and Cobb's rule. So before we go into that, does anybody have any questions on carbocations? The couple things that we should recap are knowing that they are electron deficient 
electrophilic centers. That is never gonna go away. Always remember that. Also know that they are sp2 centers with an unhybridized p orbital. That unhybridized p orbital is very important. If I were to ask you what is my um, electronic geometry of a carbocation, you know that it's an sp2 center. That's one of the things that you had to memorize in the beginning of the class. sp2 is always trigonal planar. So just keep all of these things in mind and they're gonna come up with these reactions. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is hydrohalogenation. And this might be daunting at first, these big words in Markovnikov's rule, but honestly, it, it doesn't, it, you don't need to know all these terms and all these words. Just following the logic will help you guys and you'll be able to apply it in every situation. So I'm not even gonna read all this, you guys can read this on your own time, but it definitely is a good synopsis of what Markovnikov's rule is. So below, we're gonna imagine subjecting our reagents to you know, a hydrobromic acid, so HBr. And we wanna know where our hydrogen bonds are gonna form and where our halide bond is gonna form. By, but we don't know the reaction yet. I'm just gonna assume that you guys don't know our reaction yet and I just want you guys to say more or less substituted or identical for right now, okay? So this is the whole concept of Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule is also known as the regioselectivity rule. Okay, regioselectivity, and it's based on region. Okay, so that's why we're talking about more substituted and less substituted size. Just work with me here, okay? So if I'm looking at this carbon, we have an isopropyl group and a methyl group versus at this carbon, we have just a plain ethyl group. So this is definitely more substituted. This is less substituted. That's all we're doing so far. You guys got that? Over here, we have this kind of long alkyl substituted chain, so that's the more substituted side. And this side, we don't even have any carbon substituents, so that's the less substituted side, okay? For C, over here, we have this ethyl group to the left, this ethyl group to the right, so these would both be identical, okay? So, that's all we were doing. So if you're able to do that right now and be able to see what side is more and less you know, substituted, you figured out Markovnikov's rule. You figured out regioselectivity, okay? Uh, okay, so I think that's all I really wanna talk there, okay? Whenever we have, and this is gonna get better with practice, but whenever we have an identical situation like we did at top here, and I, sorry, it splits on the other page. Whenever we have an identical situation here, you would have a mixture of products, okay? And we're gonna talk about that with examples now. Okay, so this is our first reaction, okay? So exciting, first reaction organic one, and you guys will have 159 more to learn. I'm not trying to scare you, but if you guys use the logic that I'm gonna give you right now, you will never have to memorize it, and it will all make sense, and you'll remember this you know, five years down the line, I swear. Okay, so for 5A, Complete the reaction schemes below by drawing the mechanistic arrows, the intermediate, and the final product. Okay, so I'm not gonna do the first one as an example. So remember, this pi bond is a source of electrons. Not only does it have you know, sigma, sigma bond electron density between you know, this, carb this carbon and this carbon, but there's also an, adi a additional, excuse me, an additional set of electrons in those p orbitals that overlap so really there are four electrons in this pi bond versus the two electrons that are in every sigma bond. So you can say that this four electron pi bond is an electron rich center. Okay, so we can say that this pi bond is electron rich. And electron rich, they like to give off their electrons to electron deficient nuclei, okay? So that's why we're gonna call them nucleophiles. Okay, so nucleophiles like nuclei because they are going to give electrons to them. Whereas, you know, carbocations are electron deficient and they like the electrons. They don't like nuclei. They don't want to give off more electrons. They want the electrons. So electron, electrophile. So definitely know those two things. So this is my electrophile in this situation, HBr. Why is it an electrophile? Well, let me draw this arrow and maybe this will help. Remember, halogens are electronegative and have a dipole moment towards the bromine. Hydrogens do not. Okay, so let me draw, you know, up here, maybe this electron cloud will help you. I think I drew this back with acid base chemistry. Okay, so you can rationalize. All these electrons are accumulating on this side, so polarized, whether or not on this side. So that makes this electro, 
this hydrogen electrophilic and that pi bond is nucleophilic. So that makes sense of why we're gonna have some sort of reaction here. Okay, so I'm gonna draw the mechanistic arrows in red. So my mechanistic arrows in red should be, it's always source to sink, again, just like the resonance thing. So a source of electrons trying to fix some deficiency, okay? But now this, this arrow basically means that I'm forming a bond to hydrogen, okay? But hydrogen can only have at most two electrons. So you can't have, you know, a bond to this and then another bond to that. So something has to happen, something has to break. So because I'm exceeding the octet, in quotes, I need to draw one more arrow. And it's like this, and it's always these two arrows. And the reason why I'm gonna draw this arrow from this you know, sigma bond in between the hydrogen and the bromine to the bromine is because we said that the bromine is more electronegative. So it makes sense that it's gonna to wanna to retain any sort of electrons that were there in the existing starting material, okay? So hopefully that logic all makes sense of why an alkene can react with this electrophile, any of these like um, hydrohalogens, okay, that's what they're called, hydrogens and halogens together. And they're gonna have these mechanistic arrows every single time. Okay, so this is where that Markovnikov's rule in regioselectivity is gonna come into play. Markovnikov's rule basically says that I'm gonna selectively have this hydrogen add either, you know, you can have this hydrogen add to position, let's just say position A, which is here, or position B. Remember, there's two carbons in the double bond. So where is that hydrogen gonna go? Is it going to A or B? And Markovnikov's rule, or the regioselectivity rule, is basically saying that that hydrogen is gonna to go to the less substituted side. Okay, the less substituted side. And why is that? So let me draw that for a second. So we said that that hydrogen is gonna to go to the B position, the less substituted position. So I'm gonna draw that line there. So if I took electrons away from this pi bond, you know, and I formed a new bond to the hydrogen at position B, I took electrons away from A. So if I took electrons away from position A, that's where my carbocation is gonna be. And this should now make sense. You had the choice of putting that carbocation on A or B. If I put it on the more substituted side, it's more stable. If I put it on the less substituted side, it's less stable. So Markovnikov's rule always says that your reaction is going to progress such that the hydrogen is going to add to the less substituted side to give a carbocation on the more substituted side because this intermediate as a whole is lower in energy, which means you can react faster and form products quicker, okay? So I know we're saying a lot of different things and I know it's a little overwhelming at first, but with practice, you guys are gonna get it, okay? So that's the first step. And then, do you have a question? I hear the microphone or something. Um, I just was wondering why, um, what's it called, B was the less substituted one? Okay, so yeah, so we have less substituted in the sense of how many substituents are coming off of it. So on that B position, we see that we have this one ethyl group to the right, versus, you know, at the A position, we have two, uh, that's why. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, so then... What was the result from, you know, step one? Well, yeah, we formed this new carbon-hydrogen bond at position B, but we also generated free bromide. I don't know if you guys recognize that, but up here, we generated this free bromide anion, okay? Now, this just makes sense. So, you know, opposites attract like magnets. So this negative nucleophile, this bromide anion, wants to attack that carbocation, which we said earlier was an electrophile. So all these reactions are nucleophile electrophile reactions, and that's what it's gonna be like kind of going forward. So the next mechanistic arrow should make sense. So it's my source to my sink. And you just formed a new carbon bromide bond. So your resulting structure is going to be, and I'm gonna keep the hydrogen here just for the first one. You don't have to draw that hydrogen in, but this is our reaction, okay? So the hydrogen adds to the less substituted side, B, and the bromide adds to the more, substitu more substituted side, position A. Okay, always watch out for the generation of potential chiral centers. In this situation, we didn't. Remember, this is a, um, it's an SP3 center, but we don't have four different substituents. So if we do have a chiral center, we'll talk about that in the next example of what to do. Okay, any questions on hydrohalogenation in 5A? All right, same thing going on for 5B. Something I'm gonna tell you right now, please, 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 please remember this. Benzene is chapter 22 in organic two. Do not, 
do not touch anything with benzenes at all until that point, seriously. Do not play with the pie bonds in benzene unless it's a resonance problem. Do not like, you know, attempt to do any sort of shifts, expansions, which you don't know yet, but do not touch benzene until Orgo 2, chapter 22, please. <laughs> okay, so when you're deciding which pi bond to use, it's never the benzene ones, it's always any other ones that you see. Okay, please do not touch benzene. Chapter 22, or go to. Okay, so same set of mechanistic arrows. I do TA for or go to as well. Yes, I do. And it's the same type of setup. I have a book for that. I have another book for that class too. Awesome. All right, so um, for B, same set of mechanistic arrows. So whether this is, you know, intuitive to you at this point or you're memorizing it, I don't know, but I hope you guys are using your logic to understand it. So that nucleophilic, you know, pi bond wants this hydrogen, which is electron deficient, like we said, because of that dipole moment. That hydrogen is going to add to the less substituted side. So, you know, it's going to be somewhere on, somewhere on this end. And that's going to result in a carbocation on the more substituted side. Okay, so that's going to be something that looks like this. And again, I'll draw that hydrogen in. You don't have to, but I'm just showing you for now. And you generated free chloride because of that step. So then your next mechanistic arrow is that chlorine coming and attacking that center. And that's our product. Okay? So if this is our product, we have one more question to ask, us, or ask ourselves is, you know, we generated a chiral center in this situation, actually. So before we didn't, here we did. And this is not enough to get full credit. So you actually have to draw both products of this and both enantiomers. And the reason that is, is we talked about this earlier. And I'm going to bring that back to this picture. We have this, you know, uh, uh, depiction of orbitals, you know, what that sp2 center looks like with that unhybridized p orbital. So you can imagine now that there is an unhybridized p orbital on that benzylic position, on that secondary benzylic position. And you can either attack from the top of that lobe. Let's say the arrow was, you know, there. Let's call that A. Or my arrow could have, you know, maybe been to that lobe, the bottom half. So if it was to the top half, I would maybe expect a wedge, you know, coming from the top. Or if it was from the bottom, maybe it's a dash coming from the backside. Okay, so that's why I would get, you know, a racemic mixture of products. Okay, and I'll explain what that word means, racemic, in a second. Okay, so you would expect, you know, if I attacked the front face of that P orbital, the wedge, and if I were to attack the back face of that P orbital, a dash. Okay, so that's the chlorine. Remember, that's just because we have the top part of the P orbital and the bottom part. So you can imagine, so this is plain. So I could imagine, you know, P coming forward, you know, P going back in. So if, you know, it attacked from this position or this side, it would be the wedge. If it attacked the chlorine from the back side, it would have been the dash. I think that's pretty obvious in terms of visual. And I think I had a question in the chat box. Let's see. It's the reason that the H bonds was on the side because we want the halogen on the carbocation. Okay, Tara, so we, th that's not the reason. We don't want the halogen on the carbocation. The reason is this step in the middle. The reason is, is that because we're generating an intermediate at the more stable position by adding the hydrogen to the less substituted position, it's more stable overall, which means the reaction can progress faster. Um, and yeah, Krishna, that, the answer to your question was there was no chiral center above. It was two methyl groups, whereas now we had a chiral center generated. Yes. Okay, so did that kind of make sense though, um, Tara? Why the driving? The driving force is the more stable intermediate, which is the second, which is the first box. It's, it's the more stable carbocation. So the formation of that is why the hydrogen goes to the position where it does. I hope that helps. Okay, and let's do one more example. So again, this might just be memory at this point, but I hope you guys are rationalizing why. So these mechanistic arrows form, you know, this intermediate. Okay, so we have an intermediate uh, carbocation. Okay, so either the carbocation is at the tertiary position or the secondary. So I want it at the tertiary, the hydrogen to add there, and then the iodine comes back in. Okay, and again, since it's a chiral center, we would have to draw both products, okay? And that's that. And I think there's another question. Of course, there you go. All right, are we good on that? So this is all we're learning to, the, to this point. 
Um, can someone tell me if you guys did carbocation rearrangements in today's lecture? I don't know if you guys got there yet. No, okay. Yeah, so. so this, what was it? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there at least for now because I know this is a new material, but I'm gonna give you some advice moving forward. Okay, so clearly this is, this is the remainder of Orgo for you guys. Um, it's gonna be all reaction heavy where you're gonna have to know how these arrows work, different reagents, you know, different transformations, things like that. Um, understanding is really important here. Like before you could have gotten away with memorizing, honestly, now you really need to understand it. I would definitely commit a sheet of paper, like here, like this is what I have in the books, if you guys have these, and I would do this. I would write one, and I would write hydrohalogenation. I'm just gonna do this as an example for you guys. Hydrohalogenation, I would say, okay, starting material needs to be, you know, let's just say a plain alkene. So I'll write maybe alkene, okay? Some sort of hydrohalogen reagent. So let's just say a hydrohalogen. And maybe I'll write like HBr. And then I'll write an arrow and I'll write alkyl halide. Or alkyl halide is just a fancy name for haloalkane. Okay, so this is your first reaction, and that's all you need to know to jog your memory back again, as you know, and maybe if you want, you can even draw an example. Maybe I can draw, you know, this, and draw, and maybe this is good enough for you. Like, if you can just see that and know the reaction, then that's fine. But, you know, if you're pre-professional, this is definitely going to come up in, you know, your MCATs, your DATs, your, your vet exams, whatever it is that you take. These reactions all come up again. So definitely just keep a nice list. Start now. You know, it's day one. Make a nice pretty list. Keep good notes. And this is going to help you a lot. Something to keep an eye out for is we are going to, I'll answer your question in a second, is if you look at... I don't know if you guys have this, but I want to show you. Okay, page 84 and 85. Okay, so we're not there yet. We're definitely a while away from this. But this is a very, very challenging aspect of organic chemistry for everyone, like for everyone. And what this, and what this type of question is, is this is called synthesis. And what it is, is it means you have some sort of starting material, you have some sort of ending material, you have no idea how many steps there are to get from here to there, or what reagents you need to use or in what order. It's kind of just a guessing game and using your orgo logic to help you. So you know like, okay, I have maybe an alkene and I wanna go to um, a halo alkene. Okay, well, I know that reaction already. That reaction is that guy. So let me do that one first, okay? And then maybe there's another reaction I have to do and then another one and another one and then that's what's gonna get me there. Okay, so again, we're ways, way off from that. But you can see how all of these reactions are gonna build and play with each other and interconnect. So definitely, definitely, definitely like don't sleep on this. Like keep watching videos. I have all of them published on my YouTube video already. So you can kind of get ahead in chapter six and already get exposed to some of these reactions. But um, I technically, I like this, this, this um, half of the class a lot better um, than the first half. I think the first half is kind of just like, how do you draw a fish reaction? How do you draw a chair? Like that is really not orgo. What orgo is, is being able to solve these complex problems and like do reagents and transformations and stuff like that. Um, and I think there was a question in the chat box. I know I'm just talking so much today. Just to make sure again, when something ends up being racemic, it's because of the Carl Center that it gives. Correct. Racemic is just a fancy term for like, because, that, because we formed a chiral center, we have both enantiomers. That's what racemic means, okay? And um, yeah, I think I can, I'll let you guys go early today. Um, if you have any questions, please fill my inbox and um, good luck guys.